G'day and welcome to another episode of the Andrew Price Podcast, the podcast for serious artists. I am thrilled to have an industry vet on this uh, podcast episode. His name is Andrew Hodgson, who Hodgson, gosh, got to get the name right, is an Australian artist with eight years of VFX experience. He's worked at studios like Method, MPC, Double Negative, and ILM, among others. He also has credentials on the Star Wars franchise, Terminator Dark Fate, Avengers Infinity War, and most recently Dune, where he spent most of his time modeling vehicles and environments. So without further ado, welcome, Andrew. Yo, how's it going? Thanks, man. <laughs> um, let's just start at the beginning. Um, when did you get interested in art and how did you get here? Okay. so. Um... I, I don't have the the standard uh, story of like, oh, I saw Star Wars and like I knew this is what I wanted to do or something like that. Like I kind of fell into this in a way. So I always was interested in art. I always, you know, wanted to, to draw and stuff like that. But, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do outside of high school, right? So I studied graphic design originally and I failed the first year because I, I was a terrible terrible student and guy I, I wasn't like fully like into it at that point i guess okay and then what happened was um we did my year and then in the second year we were introduced to a like a 3d for graphic design right which is where i was introduced to cinema 4d and the first time i touched it right i hated it like like i was like why would i want to do 3d this is kind of boring but I was kind of failing the course again and then I was like, okay, I can't, I can't fail again. I have to, you know, work extra hard. Right. So I would like stay behind and do, you know, the cinema 4d class to make sure I didn't fail. And I was actually realized this is kind of fun, actually. Like it was, it was cinema 4d for, um, for graphic design, right? So there was no, like, it wasn't about like film topology or production or games or anything like that. It was just like, what makes a pretty image, right? Mm-hmm. So I finished my advanced diploma in graphic design and I decided to take a year off and properly teach myself like how to work in film pretty much. So originally the reason I went to film was because I didn't want to deal with the modeling limitations of games. That oh, and the only really? reason I chose okay. modeling was because like you know how for example when you go to like film school, right? You have like people interested in modeling lighting, animation stuff, and then you do like group projects together, right? So you can pick and choose. But because I was by myself, I had nothing to start with from. So I, by default, picked modeling because it was first. Uh huh. So I know, so, it's, so I kind of accidentally fell into modeling, right? <laughs> by just pure random like chance. Wow, so I, okay. But you know, I was like, I was making like tanks and like aircraft and all sorts of stuff. I thought this was really fun, right? Mm. So I spent like a year making a like a personal portfolio just trying to guess at what i need to do like i would get 3d artist magazines coming in and just read through that and then copy that then realize oh actually that's a game workflow that's not a film workflow so i kind of was like failing a lot mm -hmm. like i wasn't part of any communities or anything like that i just was kind of guessing but i eventually found that by the end of the year i found a way to do the, like the film pipeline right okay so I ended up creating a folio and I sent it like what I would do is I would watch like demo reels from like all of the big rendering companies because I would list the companies, right? And I created this massive list of like 90 studios around the world, right? Okay. So I probably should mention this. I'm in Perth, Australia at this point. We have like no film school. <laughs> we have nothing like that, right? So what happened was I found like 90 studios around the world. And I sent my portfolio out to every single one of them, like no matter where it was, the most random, wow, obscure okay. places. And I heard back from none of them. No way. Like, 90. Not, and you got 90. zero. Yeah. Like no one responded to me. Wow. So I was like, all right, fair enough. I mean, like <laughs> thinking back now, it makes the message sense. received. So, like, yeah. I was like, oh, the folio is not good enough. So like I redid my whole folio in three months and I, I sent it to 130 this time. Like, yeah, I sent it to uh, even more, right? And then one company, which was Sony, got back to me. They were like, you know, thanks for the, the update. But to be honest, like, we 
like it you can't like fly a junior out with no experience like it'd be too hard to get the visa sort of thing right mm. so like oh, okay so the, the key is i have to be in the areas right mm. so i'm australian but i also have like a british passport so i was like okay cool if i have to be in the area i will either go to sydney where you know animal logic and stuff like that is or i can just go big and go to london so what i did was like i booked a, a flight to london with like no accommodation no job i'd never i'd never lived out of home before and i booked a one-year return flight so i had no choice but to try and like make it work right and my original plan was I would just like work at a bar or something. I just hand my stuff out like to like physically go into studios to hand my, my demo reel and stuff out. But fortunately within one week of being there, I met up with a guy, an Australian guy who emailed, who I'd emailed a year before who said, if I ever come to London, we'll grab a beer. So I messaged him like, hey, I'm in London. Let's catch yeah. up. Called your bluff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He ended, up being like a, that. he ended up being a good friend of mine, actually, which is pretty funny. That's great. But um, yeah, so I caught up with him and we just, you know, hung out for the day. There was no like networking sort of thing. It was it was a guy that worked at Dinoke at the time. And um, he just invited like one of his friends to lunch with us. And this person ended up being a in HR at MPC. Okay. So I told her my story, like, I've just arrived in London. I have nothing. I don't even have accommodation yet. I'm just here. And she's like, okay, would, would you be interested in being a runner? So like a, what a runner is in London is they're the people that they, you know, clean the kitchens, serve the clients coffee, all that sort of stuff, right? I was like, yeah, hell yeah. So I gave her my, my uh, contact. And then <laughs> the next day, what I did was I sat in Starbucks across the road from NBC just like refreshing my iPad like for hours. And then I got an email from MPC saying, hey, we got your contact. Are you interested in like the running position? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm across the road. We can chat now. <laughs> so, so I literally just walked straight into MPC and have like an interview for the running position. And then like, okay, cool. Next week, come back. And, and to, was it. To, was... to clarify, the running position is in the kitchen? Is that what you said? It's not in the kitchen kitchen it's just one of the tasks so a runner in it's a it's a it's a british thing right like we don't really have, i mean we have someone some studios have runners in vancouver but not many it's they they essentially do the running around for the company they you know um, like right. when clients visit they'll serve them coffee you know get them like drinks and stuff uh, all the vfx houses in london are close to each other so the runners will run drives to each other right the runners can go get props all this sort of stuff Got it. But yeah. But bottom, so I, bottom of the rung, essentially. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're it's making like, coffee and grabbing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Got it. Got yeah. it. You're, you're not an artist or anything. You're just, <laughs> yeah. You're just yeah. like. Do not touch to the computers. The Get out. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I started my job as a runner. I was super excited. I was the most excited runner they've ever seen. And I, uh, I immediately went to the asset room and I was like, I told them, like, I want to be a modeler. Like, here's my demo reel, right? And they were like, yeah, the, your, your reel is pretty cool, but unfortunately, we just don't really hire Junior anymore because we have, like, um, like they had just, like, MPC had opened their Indian office at the point. Like, most of the Junior work went there. And I was like, okay, fair enough. I, I understand that. So now, when you I say did, that right? Junior, is that somebody with no experience or it's, like, in their skill, what they've uh, uh, assessed your skill level to be at? It it's, looks yeah, like the, the entry level, like okay. the entry level position, right? Got it, got it. So, um, I was like, okay, cool, fair enough. So what I did was I would, <laughs> I would do my running shift, which is like eight or nine hours, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would um, sit in the room in my spare time and do personal work, right? And I had a rule that I had to be the last person in the room every single day, just so like people would see me. And I would do this. I was, so I'd be in NPC like fifteen hours a day. Okay. Just depending on what time the runner should start, right? Yeah. And then after three months of doing this, they were like, okay, fine, we'll give you a shot. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, so I, I pretty much just sat in the room because they were like, who the hell is this dude just sitting here like all the time? So I started, you know, talking to the artists, making friends. And then when they became quite desperate on to find a lot of people for Guidance of the Galaxy, they're like, well, Andrew's right here. Maybe we can just use him. And that's it. That's 
I just walked. That's how I started my uh, my career as a modeler, working no on guys way. in the galaxy. Seriously, so your first yeah. gig really in the industry was from a runner to Guardians of the Galaxy. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and what did you do on on Guardians? So, my first tasks were like um. So I, I enjoyed doing like spaceships and stuff, right? Like my very, very first task was to do the Ravager ship, which is essentially the Milano, which is Quill's main ship, just repurposed with guns, essentially. So it's a pretty okay. simple task. You're just swapping out parts. But I, I kind of like, I felt like I had earned this, I had this chance, right? I, I couldn't fuck up, essentially. So I just worked stupidly hard. Like I worked mm. ridiculously hard and kind of just, ended up taking all the work essentially mm, so like i did well right. with this ship and they were like oh maybe you can do another ship and then eventually i kind of just ended up doing like a third of the ships in the film which is kind of kind of intense no way Seriously? yeah i worked stupidly hard at the start so this but is it, an interesting um interesting uh topic uh because your, that first role could have gone either way right yeah it could have gone okay you're not ready go back to <laughs> making coffee yeah. um and it thankfully went the other direction which is like this guy is, yeah. is great what do you think separates like if you had to like write out like a case where it was unsuccessful what would that have looked like and versus what you think you did to, to make it successful well I think like the thing is since I'd come all the way from Australia with like kind of nothing set up as like a there's yeah. no plan B right I yeah. I felt at that point I just had to do whatever I had to to make it work so like I I worked a lot of hours at the time I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily advise everyone did this but I worked a lot of hours like yeah. being in London and not really knowing anyone it didn't really bother me to work yeah a lot. right but for me it was like because my first contract was just like a three month contract right yeah. So it's like, even for me personally, it was like, even if things go, like I get let go afterwards, I need to maximize these three months as much as I can. So I just, okay. I was like a sponge, just working as much as I can, talking, learning from, you know, people around me, stuff like that. Got it. Got it. But if, if that didn't work out, I would probably have just kept going. I would have, you know, made some new contacts, gotten more advice, maybe found another job. But fortunately, everything did kind of work out. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy just thinking about the fact that if that one person didn't meet me, my entire life would be different mm. right now. It's just kind of kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. That that sort of serendipitous meeting is something that, um, yeah, you just as as good as remote work is, there is still insane value in being in a city where yeah. industry is happening. You know, I'm having this yeah, conversation sure. with my wife right now. Because I've, I've yeah. for years I, I I've told her I want to move to LA. She's like, why do you want to okay. move to LA? And I'm like, well, despite all the problems that you know, it's not going to be as nice as living in Australia. If you want to raise a family, yeah. LA doesn't look like the sort of place to do it. However, uh, it's where all the studios are, and it is yeah. also where all of the YouTubers are. So every time I go there, oh really? I end up just having these little, you know, serendipitous. Things like I I went and had uh, lunch with Corridor Corridor because I, oh, yeah, I yeah. you know I just messaged them and was like hey I'm in the area they're like yeah come on let's have lunch and then while I was there they were like do you want to be on the VFX artist react show and I was like hell yeah let's give it a go did that nice. and then you know just just you know I, I organized dinner with some friends they're pulling out notepads and they're talking about this new technology or this new workflow or this new thing you're getting it's, it, it's just it's impossible well it's hasn't really been solved with technology um yeah. that that face-to-face -face contact so um i think your story is a credit to that that if you can move somewhere um it will give you an in like no other really oh for sure because i actually so i i swapped to concept like i'm a freelance concept artist now right so i swapped to concept like about six months ago right and i'm kind of dealing with that issue now okay like for me i i wish when i had swapped to concept i had 
it was obviously pre-COVID time and I could be in an art department surrounded by people. But obviously we can't do that now. I've been sitting at home as a freelancer for the last six months. I mean, obviously we've been working from home for like two years at this point with uh, like the effects, right? But as a freelancer, I, I'm not around these amazing people anymore. Mm. And I find like obviously learning a bit harder, mm. like not being in that productive environment. If mm. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Yeah, I, I, I was actually a little bit uh, curious to know your the, the the transition from modeling to freelancing. So you said uh, before we were talking, uh, before we hit record, that you basically have been a modeler for your last eight years, yeah. um, and now you've transitioned in the last six months just to concept. Um, yeah. yeah. What what inspired that? Okay, so there is there's a, a few things, right? Like. So for the last eight years, I've mostly done, you know, like vehicles and stuff like that for movies, right? Like, you know, Star Wars, Transformers, like Dune. I kind of did all the big things like I wanted. And I kind of wasn't really learning anymore. Mm. Like once you build like 10 spaceships, every other spaceship is the same thing. Like <laughs> it's like all the movies end up kind of blurring together at this point. It kind okay. of, um, yeah. yeah, like for me, I wasn't really learning anything and I didn't really want to do things like characters or creatures and stuff like that because you have the creature guys and character guys doing that like they can do their own thing i'd rather stay with the hard surface which is where i'm much more interested right okay and like as i'm approaching like a decade in the industry right i was feeling like i can't just stay doing the same thing forever like i feel there was like two different paths i could go at this point like you either have like leadership roles mm -hmm. or you have like design so if for me, I kind of like, I don't think I'm technical enough for design. I mean, not design, for leadership. Okay. Because like as a lead, you're meant to know anything about like, you know, hard surface, organic, and obviously like leading right. a team, right? Well, with design, like for me, I much rather enjoy the art. So the more you go up leadership, the less art you do. But for me, the art is what I care about. Like I don't care about like, for me personally, I don't care about like, you know, being a supervisor or anything like that. I'd rather just make some spaceships. And that's, right. that's always been what I've been interested in, right? So for me, I felt like concept was the way to go. Also, like with, um, you know, I, I mentioned like, uh, like outsourcing is starting to become a bigger and a bigger thing, right? Mm. Which also kind of made me realize I need to pick one to, I guess, survive like long term in my career, right? Because like, to be fair, modeling isn't the hardest thing to do. It's It's... It's not too complex, especially hard surface is seen as kind of easier mm. where design is very limited. The people that can pull off like amazing design work, right? So I ended up, hmm. yeah, going to concept and like me swapping to concept has been like this really exhilarating thing of like, oh, I get to go on like a new journey sort of thing, right? Mm. Like I wasn't, new challenge. I was kind of, yeah, exactly. Like I was quite stagnant in film as a modeler. Like it was just the same thing every day yeah but now it's like now is the very first time i've had um imposter syndrome where i'm like oh shit i i'm, I'm not that good at all it's been very like eye-opening to me how little i know moving into like design now but that's exciting for me because it means like there's many more things to learn and grow from like like i'm doing jama's um mentorship in a few weeks like these sorts of things are exciting me where like as a modeler in film yeah, after a decade, it's just kind of the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that that's kind of what happened. I um, the art director at Dineg actually was kind of the one of the people that gave me a push as well. It, it, it's funny, right? Because uh, so he was like, "I I want to steal you for the art department." I was like, "All right, okay, no no worries." And then um, he was like, "You know, just leave, and I'll hire you as, as a freelancer." I was like, okay. So I just left Dineg and then ended up getting rehired with Dineg a month later as a freelance concept artist. And that's how the transition started. Mm, but the funny okay. thing is that the art director gave me a chance because I, he saw how hard I worked at MPC. He was the art director at MPC when I was there. Okay. So it also leads into what, I mean, it kind of leads into connections being like a big deal right. in the industry. Yes, yes. There is like the moment a job is available, right? It's like, who do I already know? Yeah. Because the friction of like interviews and 
you're each, you know, the person is trying to sell themselves. They're agreeing to things that they, you know, there's this whole figuring out thing that goes on with job interviews that yep. it's so much easier to uh, hire somebody, you know, even if they're not right for the role, you often just want to yep. give it a shot just because uh, you, you've built up so much of this, this social currency with them that you know that they're yep. going to be solid. Um, so all the rest, all the technical stuff, it's kind of almost secondary sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, honestly, yeah. there's when, like when we hire like a new model or something, usually there's like a, a group of like criteria we go down. Right. So usually it's like the first row of who gets hired is who has worked here before mm -hmm. because we can trust they know the pipeline and obviously they would know people before. And then the second row is, you know, who does anyone know? Right. Then it's okay. like, then it's, recommendations and then third is just random on the internet okay so like that's how how crucial it is to have like a good name or good connections mm. in the industry right you want to be in those top those top rows hmm interesting okay got it we want to be well connected yeah and and how could somebody because obviously a, a lot of the connections obviously happen when you're in a studio yes. um that'll be a lot of your biggest recommendations but how could somebody um, build up a network without, yeah. like, if if they if they're green, they haven't worked anywhere. I mean, honestly, like now is kind of the best time for, like, say for example, like when I was starting off, I never imagined talking to a professional, like, okay, uh, through email or whatever, right? Like, you just, it just wasn't. I mean, for me at least at the time, it just never really. Um, I never thought about like, contacting people, but now like so many artists are on Twitter, on Facebook, on mm. Instagram, art station stuff. You can easily just reach out and contact these people as long as you're, you're polite. That's the main thing I'd keep in mind. Like be, be polite to these people. Like one thing I kind of have noticed is like with the ease of information and the ease of people being able to contact each other, people now expect that you they owe you their time if that makes yes. sense yes yes which is something i'm obviously not too fond of with um not, not obviously not everyone is like this but you know some people have like gotten upset if i didn't re respond as fast as they would like but you have to remember like professionals are wow. busy yes everyone has their own lives like yes. no one's just sitting around waiting to respond to a random person on the internet yes exactly but I do encourage people to reach out. Just be polite and patient. Yeah. And and what what when they're reaching out, um, what does a bad email look like, and what does a good one look like? <laughs> um, I mean, I've had people just drop their portfolio, and I was like, like that's not a like that's okay. Not, like, so don't do that. Like, yep. just, yeah, don't just paste your portfolio. And, and why not? Uh, Explain why not. It's just kind of if it feels like just like yeah you deal with this sort of thing like there's no like introduction of like who you are it's lazy. what you're interested yeah. in like that because that's the thing right if someone just drops a portfolio and it's full of random stuff we have no idea what this person wants we can't really give them that's feedback true. of that's true where they should aim for what they should include and stuff like that yeah so like a brief Very introduction true. of like who you are and most importantly what you want because mm. depending on who you are everything changes Okay. Like it depends on like the software you use changes, the um the what your folio should look like changes. Everything changes to based entirely on what you're after. So okay. like a brief description of what, what you're aiming for, I okay. think is is very important. And then obviously thank them for their time. And Got it. Yeah. So yet, uh, I Okay, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. And the most important thing is if someone gives you their feedback, thank them for it. Oh yes, that's a that's that, a big one. Yeah, I the amount of times I've seen people uh, like people to me, you know, friends have told me about this and stuff, where they will write up like a, a pretty big like explanation of how to improve their work, right, and just get no response. It's quite yeah. it's quite frustrating. It is, yeah. So yeah, just thank them for their work. they they're, um, thank them for their opinion. It sounds simple, but it does make a big difference when the person is uh, respectful and. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. that's how you build up like a connection with these people, right? Definitely. Definitely. And then like, and then say, for example, um, like this happened with, with a friend of mine, right? Someone, so I stream on Twitch, right? And this person was coming to my stream for like over a year, right? And then eventually they showed me their work. Turns out they were at Vancouver Film School, right? Mm -hmm. And 
you know, they were really interested to learn. They applied the feedback I was saying. And then at DNEG, the Greenlight program. So Greenlight was a um, like, an, like an internship sort of thing, right? The Greenlight okay. program came up. And I knew this person was in Vancouver. So we're just like... Greenlight is a sort of a recruitment for... What, what is D- yeah. what is Greenlight? It's it's like an internship program for DNEG. Uh-huh. So every every company has like an internship program. Okay. I think. Right. Great. And then, yeah, this internship program turned up and we were like, yeah, this person seems like they listened to feedback. Hmm. Maybe give them a go. And then they ended up getting hired by DNEG. No way. Wow. Yeah, it's... Wow. So okay, like, so that's a good example of someone who didn't know anyone in the industry, but yeah. So they so previously they had reached out to you for feedback. Yeah. Is that right? You'd given yeah. them the feedback, they listened, and then they yeah. came back. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I so ended up like sticking around my stream. Um, they made connections mm. with other people at DNEG, and then when the Greenlight program came up, we could vouch for them and. Mm, they end up yeah. passing the green light program and then now they work in the industry they're at digital domain now right got it got it that's good what about um yeah through social media have you ever recommended somebody after seeing some of the things that they post or yeah, anything I, i've like done that? that as well okay adam so for me it's hard for me to like like recommend people i don't personally know that well yes yeah but like when i was at ilm i saw this guy's work i thought it was you know really cool He told me he was looking for work in Vancouver and I reached out to my friend in the environment team. I was like, like, this isn't a recommendation, but look at this guy's work and maybe you can make up your own like opinion. And they ended up liking it, reaching out to him and then they hired him at ILM. Nice. Got it. Yeah. So just being polite to each other through social media, I think is the best way of making connections at this point. And I I, want to stress like if, if the person doesn't respond, like don't take it personally. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, definitely. There's been so many times where I would be like walking to work and I'd see a notification on my phone and I'd be like, okay, like I can't answer this now. I'll answer it later. I'll, you know, go through it later. And then I'll just get busy and I'll forget. You forget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially the moment you hit red on something, it might as well just not exist. It basically should be a delete yeah. button. <laughs> it's like, oh, I accidentally read it. Forgotten yeah, it now. Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. But that's nothing personal. It's just no, a simple. It is. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's... uh, Okay, so I'm a new artist. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm 15. I want to work. So this... Trying to figure out how to to send a good email. I find somebody on... I wish I was on this at 15. (laughs) Right, yeah. Maybe... All right, let's say I'm 17, graduating high school. Here is some of my Blender work. I want to work at Blizzard in character design. Um, do you have any advice? Something like that? Yeah. Okay. Something like and that. That, that might work. work. And this could be, I just find somebody on ArtStation and that yep. might work. Okay. Got it. But okay, don't take but, it personally if they don't reply. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but definitely. I don't know. Honestly, like the fact you, you brought up Blender, I think might be a good transition into that topic. Let's do that. Because I, I, I know you have like a obviously there's a pretty big blender community out there and if i was to give any like general advice to the people wanting to move into vfx like a spe- like specifically you want to work at like ilm mpc these big vfx okay. companies blender is an amazing starting point but you have to think about what these companies use on the day-to-day basis and expand your knowledge base into these other softwares. Like, I know that there's a discussion of the industry standard and stuff like that, but for these sorts of companies, there are conventions of which programs are used. Like say, for example, you wanna do like modeling, uh, rigging, layout, animation, it's usually Maya. You wanna do texturing, it's Mari, but people are starting to use Substance a bit more, but Mari, I would still say is the main one. And if you want to go into effects, I would learn things like, you know, like Houdini. And then obviously like comp is like, um, is Nuke, for example. Mm. So I yeah. think people wanting to go into these, these big VFX companies do need to expand their knowledge. Like, I think people shouldn't be too tired to one program. So when I was, I told you at the start of my journey, right? 
I, I started with Cinema 4D. But as soon as I realized that Maya was like the standard in these companies, I just swapped to Maya. Just because I knew that would give me the best chance of getting a job. So I, I know I know a lot of people want to kind of stick to Blender, right? And not nothing is wrong with Blender. Blender is an amazing program. It just depends entirely on what you want to do as a job. And this is why I said explaining the goal of what you're after when you write these emotes is important. Because depending on what you want to do, they might tell you to not use Blender. Hmm. So it's it's so people don't get like defensive immediately. Like say for example. I'll give you a very realistic example of why I would say if you want to be a modeler, learn Maya. So say, for example, in VFX, the main VFX companies, we all use Maya as our modeling tool, right? Say, for example, we have two juniors, well, not juniors, two people with no experience, right? Exactly the same quality portfolio, amazing work. One person's done their work in Blender, the other one's done their work in Maya. Who do you think would be the safest bet if there's one job? They're going to pick the Maya person because the Maya person can pick up and run faster. Yeah. But that's if just if you want to be a modeler in film. If you want to, if you don't care about the size of the studio and you're more indie, maybe Blender is completely fine. Yeah. I think it's very important for people to be aware of what they want to do. Like since I moved to concept, I use Blender now because I think Blender is the best for concept. But when I was doing Maya, I mean, when I was working my day job in film, I still used Maya. So I think it's good for people to expand into multiple different softwares, especially mm. if that's the software used for that job. Mm, right, right. Got it. That is a, yeah, it's, it's talked about a lot. I know it's a, a touchy lot. topic. Yeah, it shouldn't be, though, should it? I know. I, I don't understand why it's so controversial. Like, yeah. if... If you like using Unity and then you go to a game studio that uses Unreal, you know, you can't just say too bad I'm using yeah. Unity. Like Yeah, what do you expect? You just, it's right. I exactly. Know. You've got to be flexible. And it's exactly. running running my own company, I I that that is something that I I love is when somebody joins who is just flexible and they want to know like how can I make this easy for you, right? Yeah. Like what do you need me to do? What What are the biggest problems the company has right now that nobody wants to do? Or, you know, what What are you using for this? Oh, you're using Asana for project tracking. I'll figure that out now. Uh, oh, it's Jira exactly. for this. I'll do this now. Uh, I haven't used Notion before. I'll figure it out. Like all these little, little things. Whereas you can tell very quickly that people aren't going to make it when yep. they have pauses of like oh I, i've never done that before i've never used it and yep. it's like and <laughs> yeah what <'Cause>, <laughs> what do you want me that's to do the, yeah that's the thing right so every time you swap to a new vfx company you have to learn the company's pipeline yeah right so you have to learn like they they use their own i'm not their own render engines but say for example like uh, dna uses like clarice where um i don't know ilm uses render man when you swap from DNEG to ILM, you can't just be like, too bad, I, I like Clarice better. It's like, you have to learn Renderman. Yeah. Same thing for us as a modeler, right? Like we mostly do, I mostly do obviously just modeling, but I still need to do turntables, like great mm -hmm. turntables of my assets for approval. So I still need to learn not only the pipeline, I need to learn their rendering programs just to do my presentations. Mm. Yeah. So professionals are usually quite flexible anyway. Like when we obviously, like I said, like when we swap to a different company, we have to, everyone gets like a week or two of training to learn their pipeline. Like it's yeah. all through Maya, but it's still different. It, the way they organize their structure, the way they check things in and out of the pipeline, it's still different between every studio. So most professionals are quite flexible in learning different tools, which is why I, I don't understand why people are so like stuck on one program. It's, it's always good to be flexible because you're going to have to be professionally. Like it, that's just how it is. Yeah. You have to learn absolutely. that. You have to learn that pipeline. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I, I think also, I don't know, coming, coming back to the, where we started with uh, saying you're a blender artist, that can also yeah. be not a thing you want to broadcast out to the world. Yeah, I, let I them figure that I, out when they look at yeah. your art station. That's kind of your your tool of choice. Yeah. But when you say blender artist, 
it kind of you're almost subconsciously telling them like it's what i like and yeah i'm gonna be maybe resistant to Maya or something like people <laughs> won't actually like portfolio matters number one yeah. um and then they're thinking like is there going to be that three week training period where they need to learn yeah. maya because that that's the other step like if they're a great yeah, artist exactly. but they don't know maya yet they'll they could still hire you but there's going to be yeah two to mm. three weeks of uh setting aside training where they have to pay you to to learn the thing because yeah so that that's the thing right like when you <laughs> like like don't take this the wrong way but by default a junior or someone that has no experience is technically a risk or like a liability it to is. a company right yeah because you you they don't are. know if they can survive in the production environment like yeah. modeling for film and like modeling some personal work are two completely different things you the, your, your limitations your restrictions are, obviously there's no limitations or restrictions to your personal work but there's many in place in film so by looking at someone's art station you can't really tell if they're going to fit into this environment so you have to trust they can yeah but then if you have to add training them the program on top it's an even bigger risk and by default what happens then is if you're putting the risk of training this person you also need to train them the program what is naturally going to happen it already happens by default without training the program but your other seniors will have to dedicate some of their own time to mm. assisting the junior yes. and that's that's obviously completely normal that's expected right but the fact that you would have to also train them the program as well is mm. just a massive risk it is so i i personally feel even if you like using blender as a person as like for your personal work i think it's still good to know maya mm -hmm. just so you can say and move into the position like fluidly yes definitely yeah like even like if you just downloaded a trial 30 days yeah make a couple of assets with it, it yeah. you don't have to show it to anyone you might even get to privately hate it and say how much you yeah. hate this software and it's junky and it's not as yeah. good as blender but you keep all that private but then when you've got mm. that interview with them and they're like so we could see you using blender do you have any experience with maya you can say yeah a little bit yeah, exactly. i'm not a pro at it but i've got a little bit i've made yeah. a few things with it they'll be like oh great Phew. Mm. So, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. So my portfolio, I mean, my original portfolio when I started, like three quarters of the work was done in Cinema 4D. But I, I did my last two pieces in Maya just so I, I had Maya knowledge. Mm. And then right. obviously when I got the job, I could just walk straight in. Because mm. that's the thing, right? Like, <clears throat> like a junior is a risk and a liability. So you want to minimize the risk as much as possible. Because another yeah. <clears throat> thing you you might deal with is if someone comes in and they, for example, refuse to learn your conventions. That's another thing. Where Explain say for example, that. if we know, like say for example, someone comes in they're like, oh, Blender's a thousand times better in this way. Why mm. should I listen to you when this person's got like a decade of experience? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Where if we see you're at least willing to learn the program, we can see you're at least going to be more of a team player. Because like being yeah. a team player is the biggest part of production, which is different from personal work. Because like with production, like at personal work, you just do what you want as you feel like, right? But with production, you could be like, like coordinator comes over, like okay, you have uh, 25 days to build this thing. So for me personally, I never really feel like I finish the work. I usually do the most I can within the bid days we are given because mm. the bid days are quite short, right? So for production, you need to really schedule yourself efficiently. And what happens is during that time, those 25 days might also include feedback. And so you need to, you need to finish it before the 25 days so you have time for adjusting feedback, right? And within that time, uh, the rigor may be free. So the rigor might ask for a temp model. So then you need to be in a position where at any point you can quickly bash out a temp model for rigging or like the texture artist might want to do tests for texturing. So you need to have things in a way where you can delegate different tasks at any moment. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean like, like modeling for production is so different to personal work because personal work, you only think about yourself. But in production, you're constantly needing to talk to other departments and go back and forth. You can't just kind of lock yourself off and do yeah. whatever you want very different and we don't know if a junior can do this so 
but if they at least know the program, they're at least kind of like on board to start mm-hmm. with, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's giving the hint that you're uh, trainable, teachable, and yes. you're not, you know, going to be resistant to, uh, to, to learning things. Um, I yeah. kind of think of it like, as we're talking about this, it's almost like uh, they, they say with, uh, with like sales, or like whatever, that there's a funnel, right? And th- there's a funnel with uh, your career in in the software as well. But like if you think of like the biggest part of the funnel, the top, is the sea of artists that are on social media or on ArtStation. Yeah. They're all posting all their stuff, right? So a recruiter who's looking for potential artists, they're going through that, right? The next rung down is the ones that passed the the smell test, you could call it. They've got, yeah, yeah they've got a, all right, they've got a pretty decent portfolio. Then it's uh, the next rung down from that is how do they actually work with other people? Or like as in yep. not not actually working, but like when we're emailing people, you can actually learn a lot just from the emailing mm. back and forth of, uh, you know, whether or not that they're, how quick they are, um, they turn up on time and how they present if they themselves. If they listen to feedback, how they present yep. themselves how approachable they are and yeah, just willing to listen and learn. And then it's the actual, like, let's try this person out either in an internship yeah. or, a, you know, give them a, a sort of an art test or something like that. You learn a heap there. Um, and then the actual one that gets the higher is like down there. And then probably like the next yeah. rung down from that is like the ones who get that initial high, the first year of their career. And then the ones who continue in their career growth, it's like even more, yeah. um, <laughs> but it's yeah. it's yeah being aware of that so i think like a lot of artists think purely in terms of that top rung and getting down to the yeah. second one like how do you get a portfolio which is important yeah. obviously you're not going to get anywhere all this networking how to work yeah. with people won't mean jack if you've got yeah. jack in your portfolio yeah, right exactly i mean also like on that point like i would much rather hire uh, like a someone who uses Blender, but their portfolio has production thinking over like a general Maya, uh, like a Maya artist that hasn't really made a portfolio tailored to what we do. So I'll, I'll kind of explain what that means. Yeah. So for example, one of the guys who went through Greenlight, there's a guy named Andrew Dyer, who um, ended up, yeah, obviously passing through and coming to Dineg with us. So he only had one thing in his portfolio but it was done extremely well and it showed us he knew production thinking. And that for me, like for me, I liked his breakdown bigger. I liked his breakdown more than the actual renders himself. Like for example, he showed how he had like his hierarchy of his structure done quite well, the same way we would do it. He would have his UVs. What's the hi- sorry, hierarchy of structure? What do you mean? So this is, I don't know how to really go into this because this is the thing that's not in Blender and it's something I, I really <laughs> it's it's the object grouping thing I never shut oh, up. Oh right. Okay. It's that. So What's Blender missing? Tell us. But the the grouping it, thing, let's let's start there. Any any time I talk about uh, anything on tw- like uh, so first up on Twitter, like I, I so for me I'm quite blunt as a person. But on Twitter, I come off even more blunt than I intend to. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so object grouping, all object grouping is, is imagine um, collections with transforms, but for moving meshes around together. Okay. So that's essentially what object grouping is. And so for oh, example- right, in f- okay. So you're actually like film? selecting the, like just being able to like, Rather than like having to right click the collection saying select hierarchy and then yeah. moving it, you can just select it and then just move it. Yeah. It's that's part that's of it. That's yeah. a very, a very b- simple version, but that's pretty much it. So, for example, like in like Blend, I mean, there are add ons that kind of do touch on this. It's not as flexible as Maya, but at least it's like a start, right? But say, for example, like the easiest way if you have several objects which are separate meshes like if you want to move them all together the easiest way is to just join them together and move them right where in a film we have to leave everything as separate geometry separate, as much yeah. as we can especially transformers because transformers are like ten thousand objects 
You mean as like an actual transformer from the movie Transformers? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the ones got we it, built, there's like 10,000 objects. Wow. And we have to leave them separately because the animators move them independently. So for the transformations. Uh, right. right, got it. But so, yeah, like, but there's very specific ways how we organize our hierarchies in movies. Like, say, for example, everything, like you have, imagine a, a plane, right? You have the top group would usually be the group name of the asset. Um, you know, aircraft, stealth bomber, some random thing okay. like that. And then within that, you would have the left and the right hierarchy. Okay. So within that, you would have the left group, the right group, and then break that down. You would have like the right wing, the right tail fin, the right thruster. And it kind of, it's just groups mm. within groups within groups. And it makes it, especially for rigging, it makes it a lot easier because they can rig based on the groups and not the geometry. So if you set up your hierarchy early and the rigger is okay with it, you and the rigger can essentially keep working at the same time, to a degree. Hmm. Really? Okay. But yeah, yeah, so what Andrew did was he obviously showed, because he would come to my stream as well, right? Like he would see how I would lay out my hierarchy, and he just mimicked it. He would see how I would lay out my UVs, mimicked it. He would show the UVs are efficient, clean, broken up into different UDIMs. Hmm. So that is really impressive to me. Wow. More than the renders, I feel. Yeah, 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 right. And obviously clean, clean topology, like subdivision topology as well. Right. Yeah, that's so true. I hadn't even thought of that, but you're absolutely right. You can, it's almost like that in, in school, the show your workings, right? Yeah. The teacher wants to know that you didn't just get the right answer. Yeah, you exactly. You also understand how you're doing it, um, yeah. which I guess is important. So having a breakdown that shows all that, hierarchies yeah. the clean uvs all that kind of thing will show you yeah. that you've at least thought about uvs you haven't yes, exactly. photo bashed the final result yeah or just wrestled it into submission through some yeah, archaic exactly. workflow because right. that's the thing right like especially as an asset artist like in modeling you're not going to be doing your texturing in the in the top studios right yeah like okay you're, yeah you're either just a modeler or a texture artist you're not mm. going to do both mm. because we just simply don't have the time to do both mm-hmm like there are times that the texture artist will start before the model is even finished. And when the model is finished, you need to go onto the next model while they're texturing your work. Mm. So, and then there's feedback and all this sort of stuff. So if you show me as a modeler, you can care about your fellow texture artist. That's obviously a big plus because I mean, the texture artists have to use your UVs. You don't really want to, you don't want to screw the texture artist. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I feel like yeah, if you can show like a good breakdown of this is a production asset, it's much better to me than just oh here's a pretty render. Mm, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that is uh for sure. Like now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, you sometimes you see someone sent you a, you know, a link to their art station project or something and it's this you know, it's a beautiful well-lit scene with everything. I'm like my first question is like how much did you make versus yeah. what assets did you buy? Because if, yeah, if it's a modeling position, like that's kind of important. Yep. And yeah, do you texture sure it all? Is that on someone else? It's like, is this part of a group project? Was this yep. from a film? Like sometimes, like, and sometimes I learned that all they did was like compositing. Like, so you just framed oh. the shot and you put that in your portfolio. <laughs> like what? Like you, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what they, if they want to just be a compositor, maybe. But yeah. Like, yeah. It's a bit niche. Yeah, I, for me, it surprises me when modelers send me their reels without showing me the wireframe because I care about that more than the render. Mm. And what are you looking because for? Because just clean, efficient quad topology. Okay, right. It's like not all to know that the, over the top. Yeah, exactly. So are there poly that, you know, budgets in, in VFX? Not really. Like I, I told you, like one of the main reasons I want to go to film was because like we don't have the limitations of games, right? We we don't have poly budgets, but you should still work within reason. Okay. Like you don't want your ass your spaceship to be like fifty million polys because some poor rigging artist will have to pick that up. <laughs> like <laughs> and the texture right. artist will have to take this into Mari. Like it's yeah, I see. You there's no budget, but whatever you whatever it takes to get the film asset looking good, but you should be efficient. At okay. the same time. Okay. Right. Got yeah. It. Don't just subdivide your thing a thousand times. Like, yeah, job done. Throw it in. Right. I see. Like, got it. Got it. Yeah. Like I, I've heard people talking about like to get rid of an end gun, just subdivide the mesh. I'm like, oh, please don't do that. Like, 
you're, you're increasing the poly count of the assets so much more than you need to when you could just terminate the endgon another way. Ah, uh, okay. Right, so they're saying like add more polys and then you could like create a fill loop? Yeah, Is that so, what they're saying? So when you subdivide an endgon, it automatically turns it to quads. Oh. So... I mean, I'm thinking about but, an endgon wrong. Okay, yep. Yeah, so an endgon's like a five... Uh, mm -hmm. five or more faced uh, face. Okay. So if you subdivide your mesh, it will turn it into quads. Ah, but then you've now, I see. Yeah, yeah. You've, you know, added the poly count. You've, you know, multiplied the poly count four times for no reason, essentially. Mm, right, so right. So don't do that. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, one uh, Andrew Dyer was an, uh, yeah. someone who watched your stream and they learned some of these things. Uh, yeah. My question is, is yeah, what what are some ways I was gonna ask? What are some ways that people could do it? I guess besides watching Twitch streams, um, but are there any other resources that you know? Because like, I, I mean, I've heard this so many times. Like, you go to SIGGRAPH, there's always a yep. an event or a, a, a talk where they've got all the universities, um, <laughs> you know, all the they've all sort of come there to talk about the state of education. And you can yeah. tell they're all like desperately like flailing. They're like, what do we need to teach the kids? And the people in the yeah. industry are like, oh, we don't have time to explain. You know, yeah. <laughs> we got we got stuff to do. Like, you know, but like yeah. there's, they don't know what to teach them. And yep. there's such a huge gap. In fact, I've heard mm. some studios say that basically the, the gap is so big, they have to reteach them everything that they learned yep. through university because it is so bad. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of crazy because like even some of like the like I'm gonna say my my friends that did end up coming to DNEG like the information they got told in school really shocked me like it was not like they kind of went against their like teacher and just followed what I did and then they got a job like fair enough but like <laughs> like they they were told like VFX companies don't care about topology and that they just can fake their bevel with like a, a redshift node and I was like we don't do that at all like it's, mm. we we only care about the topology like i was kind of shocked like schooling hmm. i mean there is obviously some very good schools out there but some schools are also very questionable yes unfortunately yeah i i still think like like to like obviously learn like the proper workflows reaching out to the professionals i think that will be willing to like the professionals that are willing to help i think uh, is much better than I guess blindly believing your instructors at schools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Some schools are very good though. Like Think Tank I know is a really good school because they're actually taught by professionals. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the, if yep. you go to the the rookies, the rookies.co I think it is. Oh yeah, that has like got, the top schools and stuff. They've got the ranking of um basically they they vet the schools to find yep. out what what schools are actually worth your time. Um and I think if your school that you're thinking of applying for isn't mm -hmm. even on the site, then that should tell you everything you need to know about that school. Um, because it is yeah. the industry, that's like, that's where you go to learn what schools yeah. are good. So, um, mm. yeah. And I, I think like to the teacher's credit, um, they might have perhaps heard from a, a studio that they don't care mm. about topology, but who knows? Maybe it was just like yeah. a studio that does like advertising. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, or like a, yeah, like a little freelancing studio or something where, some guy was gung ho and like, ah, oh, we know what we're doing, you know. Yeah. But I mean yeah. on the subject of school, I I don't think you need schooling for this job. Because mm -hmm. I I'm self taught. And like there's so much information out there. I feel like it you can learn by yourself. Like for example, I've never once been asked about my schooling, ever. It's never even come out at any studio. Like hmm. they don't care what company I mean they care what company you've been to. They don't care what schools you've been to. They they really don't. They, your schooling doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is your portfolio. Hmm. Okay. So I feel. So I, I don't. I don't think like if you can't afford to go to these schools, I don't think that obviously means you can't get into VFX either. Like, there's yeah. so much information out there. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of misinformation out there as well, which is is a bit unfortunate. Like, I mean. The amount of people that have told me I'm I'm wrong that you can work in VFX and Blender is is mind blowing, but 
like there is misinformation out there, but I think if you're listening from a reliable source, someone that has the job that you want to do is much easier, much better to like talk to them. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. And I think there's also, because uh, I'm learning this with, with Polygon, we're focused on ArchViz, right? Okay, that's cool. And, and ArchViz is primarily 3D Max. Yep. And I don't want, I, I wish it wasn't because okay. I don't know 3D Max. Um, yeah. And the whole, you know, the plugin thing, it's all kind of like locked in. It's hard to kind of to unwrap. And they're also working with uh, Revit files in DWG and importing it is is a problem. And all the problems that they're dealing with are so different than if you look at or talk to an individual freelancer or somebody that's just yep. doing ArchViz for fun. They mm. are basically two in, entirely separate categories. And I imagine it's the yep. same with, VFX or anything like that. The challenges yeah. at a professional level are completely different challenges yeah. to an individual level to the point that yeah. they're often not even related. They should be considered separate yeah, totally. things. Um, and you'll, when you talk to a professional and they tell you Maya is the industry standard for VFX, yeah. if you don't know Maya, you don't want it to be true. So you're biased. You're thinking yeah. in terms of like, yeah, but I know that uh, Barnstorm uses Blender. Yeah. I know that it's it's being picked up more and more. And I've heard reports from people that that's old yeah. thinking and that this is, so you'll, you'll sort of start like leaning like into your comfort zone of like, okay, yeah. it's all right. I can keep using this thing. It's, it's, it's yeah. really, it's just a resistance that I think is natural. It's like learning, yeah. like learning a new language. It's like, why don't you want to yeah. move to Japan or get a job in Korea? Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, I got to learn a new language. It's like, well, you could, couldn't you? Yes. Yeah. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> you know, yeah. you could learn Maya. Yes. Mm. There's only so many hours in the day. Um, but you, you, you have to, I, I guess, put your, um, would you call it your influence into perspective at a studio? Yep. They're not going to change the industry for you, <laughs> which yep. should just yeah, be know, like, right? like so obvious, yeah. but it's, it's, you have to remember that, that these yep. it's, it's like, it's a giant steamship, right? Mm. And it's just plowing through the ocean. Yep. And when it changes, it's going to be slow, you know? So yep. you as a little artist in a little nimble speedboat, you can zigzag mm. and you can try this and try that. And, oh, this is the one and substance has taken off here. The steamboat will take a while yep. to turn <laughs> many years. And until it's yeah. turned, you got to learn what they're using or you got no chance. This is, this is the, the thing, right? Like a lot of people think like, oh, why don't, uh, you know, VFX companies just swap to Blender. It's free. And it's like, do you know how much money it would cost to retrain literally hundreds of people on six-figure salaries? A lot. Can you imagine? Yeah. Not and that's just, just the training. Yeah, that's the pipeline. Training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Not, that's not rebuilding the pipeline. That's not testing the pipeline. That's not to deal with the, end, like the inevitable money you lost by not hitting your deadlines. Mm. Uh, like risking client um, connections because you can't deliver your project, like you said you would, because you're testing new things. Like there's so many things that go into it. Even simple fact that say, for example, in a VFX company, every single thing has documentation, everything. Like how to do any, like if you want to do digi doubles, there's the entire digi double process mm. through the studio in documentation, recorded videos, talk over everything. It's like the confluence pages of VFX companies are huge. Can you imagine paying someone to redo all the training just so we end up with the same product we had before. Like mm. it's, it just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. That's also, right. most professionals don't know Blender. Mm -hmm. So it's you're, you're, you're now narrowing your talent pool that you can hire from. Yes. There's, there's many yeah. different things that go into a company swapping. The, uh, like if for a company to move like that much, it has to be something really big and houdini i think is the yeah. main thing companies are interested in right so, like companies yes. are starting to imp like they are starting to change a bit but it's more houdini they see much more potential in houdini and i don't think i ever hear anyone talk about blender mm, right this is just the top companies by the way like a lot of people think if i say learn Maya, if you want to go to ilm they 
misinterpret that as me saying Blender is bad. It's not. Like, that's why I keep saying it's entirely about what your purpose and your goal is. Mm. Like, if you want to, like, for example, I freelance, right? I use Blender now because it's better for what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. If I want to go back into VFX, I learn, I or I obviously know Maya already, but I just, I go to using Maya. Yes. That, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I think, um, I was going to say, talking about the, uh, ah, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, what was I gonna say? Ah, well, it's gone now, but that's all right. Um, yeah, I, I I feel like we've we've uh, touched on a lot. Um, I I did want to get to eventually talking about the Hollywood uh, VFX shot workflow. Um, so could you walk me through when you're working on something like June? Um, okay. What does it look like when there's a a shot in the movie that you've that everyone just watched it's five seconds long or whatever it is yeah from script to final delivery i'm sure it varies across studios but how does it how could something like that typically look like um i will obviously like every single film is exactly the same so i'm not going to talk specifically about tune but like like in general obviously what comes is we we get the previs i mean obviously in vfx we are way past the script right we just get like the previs will come in of what is needed for the shot. And what's so what previs? Pre- previs is like, it's a basic animation of what the sequence will look like. So firstly, a VFX company only gets the previs for the sequences we're working on. Okay. So say for example, you're working on a movie, you only have access to see what your VFX company is working on. You don't have the whole movie. You mm-hmm. just have thing. You don't even have sound a lot of the time. You just get the shots. So what happens is the shot will come in, and then the lead will break down, okay, we see this many assets in the shot. We see the assets this close, so we can guess it will take this many days to do it, right? So then what happens is, obviously, yeah, the previous done. We will start the modeling based entirely on what we see in the previous. Okay. We'll model it. We'll texture it. It'll get rigged. And then obviously go to like animation stuff. At the same time this is happening, we will do like a temp version of the model and we'll give that to layout. And layout essentially recreate what the previs is in house. So they set up the, the 3D scene for what the shot will be. So we will do the modeling, the texturing, rigging. I mean, look dev is in there as well. And then that will obviously go to animation for the shot. So we okay. work in assets, we work in an asset bubble where in animation, layout stuff, they work in a shot context. So they will work in the shot 0158 or whatever, okay. while we will work within the bubble of whatever asset stealth bomber. So, so model, rigging, texturing, look dev, all within that bubble. And then that gets fed into the pipeline and they use it in the other departments. Then it obviously goes through you know effects, lighting, comp, and, and then environments. Okay. And that's essentially like the whole right. pipeline of a shot. Okay. This whole thing, though, it will go to comp. They won't like the model. It will come back to modeling. We will do changes. That will affect the textures. It will affect the rig. It will then have to... The animation oh. needs to be tweaked. And it's it's a constant back and forth. How fun. And this is... I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I mean when we don't know if... Like a junior is able to hand this production form of thinking of being aware the context of how their assets used. So when you're working in a studio, we're not creating art. We're creating a product for someone else. So, of course, that's a whole other thing about not getting personally attached to your work. But you have to be aware that you're creating a product that is being utilized by many different people at the same time for a final image that will be dictated by someone else. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you have to be very aware of, oh, I better not do this because this will screw texture up. Mm-hmm. Or if I do this, I need to tell rigging this is going to change. And then that's going to delay people's shots from occurring. So that's why coordinators are so important and management because you're constantly juggling all these fucking cats like, <laughs> running around like crazy. It, I'm, wow. I'm surprised movies get done, to be honest. It's <laughs> it's so many shits just going on. And then the director's like, no, nah, I don't like any of it out of the film. Yeah. And then we just we just move to the next thing. Like, that's just wow, how it is. that's crazy. Got it. So to backtrack, so it's uh, pre It's all like blocky barely shaded just kind of Mm. jagged things just so that they know the beats of the shot the framing 
how close yeah. things with are. With that Unreal, camera. that's actually starting to change a bit, though. Okay, explain that. So with this Un- is a potential industry change. Is that right? Yeah, I know a lot of previews are now much more interested in things like Unreal because they can get like a nice visual representation of what mm. it will look like instead of these gray boxes. I mean, I always mm. know preview does, but some of the stuff I've seen is pretty crazy with Unreal. Right. Okay. Got it. But yeah. So, essentially, yeah. Pre- so it's a it's just a more detailed. Uh, yeah. Essentially. With lighting. Because one of the things is when we see previews, we can't see what. Um, we can't see like dust flying around. We don't know. We don't know what the lighting course, looks like. Stuff right. Like that. So the modeler so we, is then putting detail into this shot that might not be visible once the compositor. Yes. Got oh, it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> June, June, June is a prime example of that. Oh, we, we do right. have. We do have to overbuild to an extent that it will hold up for whatever the shot will be. Essentially. Mm-hmm. Got it. So we build the asset purely based on the shot. If we see a close up. We have to now tailor the model to the close-up. That makes sense. Because I was going to ask this, like there might be a shot. Yeah. Okay. So let's say, for example, the harvester that you did. Maybe it's a bad example because you yeah. can actually think. Of, but like, okay, let's say there's a there's, there's a spaceship, right? We need this spaceship yeah. in the in the movie, um, and it's viewed from a far medium angle, you know, yeah. in this sort of shot. But then there's one shot where the camera's on the wing. And you can yep. see all this detail and stuff. Do they create, do they do the whole model to that standard? Or is it, they just do it at the far angle and then they do a separate version just for the up close? Honestly, I mean, it depends, but I would say it's a safer bet to model. I think it's a much safer bet to model for the close up of the wing shot because if they like the model, they're probably going to add more more shots later. Oh, right. It's it's much easier to overbuild the model than to build a mid res one, a shot specific one for the wing, and then the director likes it and wants to move the camera to another close up. Because then we'd really? have to rebuild the whole asset. No so it's way. always much easier to overbuild because the directors will change their mind like that's just that's the natural nature of working in a creative industry like these directors on these movies for like two three years like their shots will change quite a lot hmm. i thought it was so, the yeah. opposite i nah, i we, thought we for sure you you try to be efficient as you can mm. with the uh you know the detail and only put the detail where it's required so you're saying that they will it's e- it's more efficient to overbuild because it's more flexible with shot changes. Essentially, yeah. I mean, when I say mm. that, like I wouldn't detail the cockpit, stuff like that. Like if we don't see the cockpit close, you wouldn't detail the cockpit. But okay. you would still build the plane to a good level. Because there's so many times where like, yeah, they will just simply move the camera or they'll just mm. cut the whole plane from the film. Like it's, this <laughs> is very, it's very normal. So this junior artist that's spent three weeks modeling this thing uh, down to the nuts and three, bolts. More, three weeks, more like three months. Oh, really? Like, oh, wow. Like, yeah. There's so many times. I remember that my very first wow. like heartbreak in VFX was I worked on Rocket's Warship for Guardians of the Galaxy. It was the first asset I took from start to finish. So it's like a four-winged ship, right? I, I actually absolutely love the design. And we built it. It was a like everyone liked it and then the director's like oh i don't like the bottom wings we just had to slice the ship in half and redesign the whole bottom of the ship we need that the thrust has got taken out of the bottom wings put on the top and we just had to do it like it's the clients paid for it we we simply do it we have to accept that this is not our work yeah i mean it's our work but it's not our property it's his yes yes so if he wants it we give it to him and that's where it comes back to that the individual problems versus the professional problems yeah. being entirely different. Yeah. They the as an individual, it's all it's your baby. Everything is up to you. You you're you're the director yeah, exactly. of your piece that you're putting in a portfolio. Yep. Yeah. And you have to forget all of that when you go yeah. to work in a professional environment. Yeah, exactly. You can't put your foot down and go like, no, it looks better. <laughs> yeah. I'm- Another thing is like to, to keep in mind is like, say, for example, I would be working on an asset and I feel it can be pushed further, but the client approves it. It's done. You stop. There's mm. no more working on it. As soon as the client approves something, you stop. So that's why I mean, like hmm. there's plenty of times where I feel like I could have detailed more. Yeah. But they approved it. So we just stop. 
like mm-hmm. we just stop move on to the next thing like this it's production it, we're not creating like personal art so that is a, a big thing i i think people should think about before coming to this industry like we are not just creating spaceships for fun we don't just get to put up whatever we want into it mm-hmm. we do have to create someone else's product yeah yeah so having a bit of the, it's really fucking hard though i still get super super attached to my work so, <laughs> it, well that's it like because everyone yeah. starts as a as an artist right yep. and you lo- you and that 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 rush that you get from leading your own creative mm. work it's still there when you're yep. modeling the nuts and bolts on this thing that's going through 30 changes as you go up so yep. that's that's got to be hard to let go but it's so essential right yeah it yeah it's it's impossible it's something you just have to deal with like there's so many times you'll see all the previews and you're like oh this shot's gonna be amazing i can't wait to put this <laughs> in my demo reel this is gonna be super cool it's all gone it's like uh, okay yeah yeah next asset like it, it's just this is how it is or like something that will happen is like you need to be aware that it's not just your work like say for example i could be working on uh let's just say for example independence day I built this huge orbital cannon thing. But I was only one of the artists on it. You have to be aware that it's not just your work as well. Like there's lots of modelers around it. You need to obviously be aware that it's not just your art. So if someone has like other pieces which are useful to you to save time, don't rebuild it. Just take that piece and put it on yours. Like things like that. Mm, if that right. makes sense. Yes. Yeah. You you got to be efficient. That's the, yeah. that's the one thing at, at, at polygon <laughs> at least i know it's got to be for every studio mm. is like when an artist like spent a couple of weeks making something rather than like just buying it or yeah like just doing a like r and Ding it and learning a process rather than yep. reaching out to someone else at the company who already knows yeah. the thing or like something like that like That's, you've got to remember uh, your boss is paying your wage and yeah. like every dollar matters and you yeah. are, if if you're wasting the boss's money, that's one way to not get on the boss's side, exactly. you know? <laughs> not get hired um, next time. I kind of want to touch that subject you mentioned about like reaching out. I think that is one of the key, most important things to being an artist in production as well, regardless of your skill level. Like if you don't know something, ask someone. Like mm. it, like it, it frustrates me so much when people, someone would be like, "Oh yes, I can do this." And then like a week will go by and then it turns out they didn't actually know what they were doing. Mm. Like regardless if you're a senior, mid, especially junior, if you don't know something, just ask. There's so many people that will help you. And it just it makes everyone's life easier. Like say, for example, on Uncharted, I did digidoubles. The only time I ever did digidoubles in my entire career, I had to learn digidoubles on the thing. And I just asked my friend who's the lead, like, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. I might need some questions answered. And he just held my hand, showed me the way, and we did the work. There was no problems. Mm, yeah. So I think it's very important, regardless of your skill, to be very vocal about what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, cause, like people yes. aren't going to judge you. Yes. Like, I, I would much rather, especially a junior, like I cannot, cannot stress enough for a junior. Like a juniors, a lot of time juniors think, I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to, I don't want to think I don't know what I'm doing. I think a junior above all should ask what they need to do mm. or just be very open about, I'm not experienced in this. I'm not comfortable with this. Can I have a hand? Mm. Yeah. It's much easier than, you know, dailies come around and the person has no idea what they've done. Like, yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. But it's also, I think a fine balance between, you know, saying I don't know how to do something, but also mm. portraying that conveying that you are ready to, you want to learn it. As opposed to yes. like going like, oh, I I haven't done animation before and going yeah. and then the other person's like yeah but we need you too can you learn yeah that? exactly it's uh yeah there's 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 a difference there it's it's saying oh, yeah, I don't know sure. how to do something I want yeah. I will learn it I will do whatever you want me to but I'm just saying it's I should probably learn from somebody else at the company yeah exactly yeah I'm I'm not yeah I'm saying like be like I would like don't like make excuses or anything just be like. I am not super comfortable with it. It might take me some more time. And if they're aware that it might take you more time, they could just simply, um, like, what's it called? Like, maybe give you extra bid days for it. 
mm. things like that. Like yeah. there's a way of working around it instead of the coordinator coming around being like, why haven't you hit the bid days? If you're What's a, a very, bid day? A very, bid day? A bid day is just, a bid day is like, like bidding. How long it will take to do something. Ah. Oh. Wait, so this is when you, you've got multiple studios bidding on a project? Uh, I, that's essentially what the bid day is, but I, yeah, maybe I shouldn't use the term bid day. The bid day is like, yeah, the bidding side. And then like the, obviously the awarded days is, I don't know, say for example, you have 10 days to make a spaceship. That it was like 10 bid days. Essentially, you just have 10 days. Ah, oh. so it's when you've yeah, said ahead of time what you can achieve something in. Yes. And then you've got to actually hit that. Yes. Right. Got you got to try. You got to try. <laughs> I, but sometimes where like I'll get I'll be told like oh yeah, we need this entire massive cruise ship built in twenty days I'm like yeah that's not happening like <laughs> just, I mean, I, I'll just be completely nope. honest like also that's another important thing I think it's good to be honest about like like I'll I'll try my best like right right yeah yeah, yeah. got it got it I guess that's something that comes oh. with experience as well you're able to gauge time it takes to do things as well right yeah. That for yeah, sure maybe. matters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. But that comes through experience. I wouldn't expect a junior to be able to gauge bid days. Got it. Yeah, that that whole concept is. Uh, I mean, bid day is the first time I've heard of it. It's not a bid day, uh, which is a totally <laughs> different thing. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's crazy. Okay. I mean, yeah, bid days is essentially just the days you have assigned to a task. But okay. I, I guess we're just. I'm just used to using the term bid day because it was the day's bid on the asset essential originally i mean got it got but it, it yeah. it's just your day is assigned essentially got it got it yeah yeah i think um yeah probably other people call it different things in engineering they might call yep. it effort uh time effort, effort or something yeah like oh, a, okay basically like yeah the effort how many hours it's going to take you 180 versus this or something like that oh uh, okay That's yeah what it's the same thing using engineering i think but um yeah, I feel Definitely like we could talk for for hours uh, about this stuff because it's so fascinating. Um, yeah. But I know you've got a hard stop uh, coming up. So is yeah. there anything, um, any final words, anything you wanted to tell people and where, where can people find you as well? Um, I mean, they can find me on Twitter. I mean, I, I say controversial things about Blender, so I don't know if they want to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I don't think it's that controversial. To be fair, like, I'm I, like, I just question what have you stuff. actually said that, like, people are, like, mad about, but then I'm not on the receiving end, so. Yeah, why, why don't we have grouping in Blender? I don't know. Like, right, I, right. I just question things, but I, it usually comes off worse than I intend to. Um, but, yeah, like, Twitter, I have, obviously, like, ArtStation, um, LinkedIn, stuff like that. I, on, I stream on Twitch, on Twitch as well. Twitch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. How is yeah, Twitch? I stream Blender on Twitch. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Yeah. We'll be happy about that. <laughs> we can we can talk about Blender on Twitch. Uh, when when you're not you, when soon. you're not using Blender on Twitch, are all the comments why aren't you using Blender? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I I actually <laughs> learned Blender through Twitch. Don't no take way. this personally, but I specifically didn't want to do the the donut tutorial. <gasps> I was like, How dare you, sacrilege! Get out <laughs> I know, of here, right? I was like I was like Twitch chat. Yeah. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna teach me a Blender. Oh, so that's we, cool. We, we spent a few days. I would have Maya open and Blender open, and be like, I did this in Maya. How do I do this in Blender? And oh, through a lot of that's pain, a good idea. We got there. Wow. How many? Um, I don't know how Twitch works. There's subscribers, followers. How does that work? Yeah, there's followers and subscribers. A subscriber right. is like a paid follower, essentially. Okay, but, yeah. but you, it sounds like you got a pretty decent sized audience there to get. Feedback. Yeah, I average pretty... about a hundred viewers a stream. Cool. Like average at at one point. Yeah, nice. But yeah, that's awesome. Okay, cool. So you're on Twitch. Find you on social media, ArtStation. We'll put all of this in the uh, the show notes so people can find this. And Andrew, thanks for your time. That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate you uh, bringing me on here. No worries. Yeah.